Welcome to Crime and Wine. I'm Pamela Fagan Hutchins, your host, and this is the show where I talk with other crime fiction writers about the stories of thrills and suspense that will leave you mystified, sometimes horrified, and always wanting more. Please join me in welcoming today's special guest. Good morning, everybody. It's Pamela Fagan Hutchins. This is Crime and Wine, and I'm coming to you from Wyoming, which is great because for the last week I've been bouncing around literally from coast to coast with my husband while we work on long stay visas for his job in France, where we'll be for the next year. So under the category of tell you a secret, what's the um, what's the news of the day? Right before I came to get on this show, after I was watering the flowers and feeding the dogs. By the way, no Malamutes today. They're outside, so there'll be no wooing and jumping on the bed behind me. I got notification that we succeeded and our long stay visas have been approved and are being couriered back to us. So I can douse the flames of my hair and be a normal human today with only 25,000 words to write to get my book turned in <laughs> before, um, before I turn into a pumpkin. So I have something fun for you today. I have been a fan and a follower for the last few years of Scott Graham, whose National Park Mystery Series really speaks to me. A few years ago, I did a National Park book tour where I literally went around to the national parks in the uh, Western United States and did book events because I am such a huge fan of our national, national parks. And you know I'm a fan of crime fiction writing. So with no further ado, let me bring on Scott Graham to talk about his series in his latest release, Death Valley Duel. Welcome. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks for having me on your show. I am so excited. And we are we are practically neighbors, oh, 10 hours apart. Yeah. <laughs> well, we live in big states. We live in big states with big mountains. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, uh, I, I just think that my viewers and my listeners and my readers, we have such synergy between some of the books I write and your wonderful series that I know that for those that aren't already a fan, they are going to really love hearing about your books today. So tell us a little bit about um, Death Valley Duel and your series. Sure, absolutely. So the new one is, as you just mentioned, Death Valley Duel, where yeah. um, we've gotten to after nine books. This is number nine in the series and about 10 years in on the series now. It is published by, the series is published by Tory House Press, which is a an absolutely phenomenal nonprofit environmental publisher out of Salt Lake City, Utah. And um, anyone who hasn't been come familiar yet with Tory House, feel free to have a look at toryhouse.org. They're an amazing organization that I, it's been a real pleasure for me to be involved with, with my series. Um, they and I have worked really closely together to kind of build this series over time to what I think is, is I'm, I'm, you know, obviously a little bit jaded, but I believe Death Valley Duel is the best one yet. It, I think, really captures everything that I'm trying to do with the series, which is both um, give people a sense of place and a sense of the national park, um, but also kind of explore issues and um social justice issues or environmental issues that are important and going on in our national parks, all within the realm of what, what is, you know, I believe a really fun, um, really exciting murder mysteries that are um, entertaining and that are family oriented. We've got an archeologist, Chuck Bender and his um, wife, Janelle Ortega and his, they, they've married, um, first married in the at the start of the series and now nine nine books in he's still kind of figuring out how to be a stepdad what to do the, the books kind of move ahead about a year um at a time they are standalones for each national park that they're set in but they they move ahead a year at a time so that nine books ago the daughters carmelita and rosie were precocious youngsters kind of six and eight eight and ten years old now it with death valley duel carmelita is 17 years old and is a champion ultra trail runner. And so we find them in the Mojave Desert where a big ultra trail running competition is taking place. And that is what drives the plot. So we've got this exciting ultra trail running race that Carmelita is competing in and that Chuck and family are serving as support crew in. 150 miles, 50 hours of running. So we go through two nights and days out in the desert 
kind of a, you know, a, a fun murder mystery that also explores some of the water issues that are inherent in the Mojave Desert, the, uh, the, the water taking from, from the Sierras down to Los Angeles and what has then become of the Owens Valley and what may eventually occur at the Great Salt Lake as well. So there's kind of a little bit of capsulization of the story. I there's so much I love about that that it almost makes me weepy. I, I was just telling Scott earlier, and many of you guys know that Death Valley is one of my favorites uh, of the parks in the U.S. And I only just visited it this year, but as an ecological miracle and and as a living representation of what our Earth is capable of doing over time, it's unmatched. It's just it's so stunning. I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, and and then to take. I, for me, I love um, I love writing and I love reading stories where an author takes something time bound like a race and puts us in the pressure cooker and and combines that um, in this case that a- athletic um, uh, you know performance that is going to be you know all encompassing with a time bound murder mystery with all of the forces of nature going on. It's like perfect. There you go. <laughs> that, that, yeah, and honestly. I knew I, I should have probably been using the clicking, the ticking clock idea for a series for for one of my mysteries earlier. But this is really the first time I've I've used that idea. And it, you're right, it's really really makes a story move. It really gives jets to the story. And so I believe this story. That's one of the reasons it's it's I think being accepted so well. It's earning really strong reviews um, is because it does have that ticking clock aspect to it. We know that the archaeological dig that Chuck is involved in, or the archaeological survey, I should say, um, is is going to be resolved at the same time as the race ending. And we've got, we know we're coming to this climax and there's that anticipation that made it really fun for me to write. And I think that comes through on the page as well. It is, is fun. And, you know, when you think about um, most crime fiction, you're generally boiling it out over a time period and giving time for things to happen. But sometimes you can just artificially crunch it down like you've done with this book and say, you know, all hell's going to break loose and it's all going to be right in this tight time frame. And right. it's so much fun. So much fun. Now, when you started this series, I know you've written other books before. You've written mm-hmm. nonfiction and, and right. stream kids and things like that. But when you started this series, how did Chuck and uh, and his his wonderful family, his uh, his stepdaughters and his wife. How did they come about? Where did they come from? Well, basically, uh, as you said, I wrote nonfiction for a long time. Always wanted to try my hand at fiction. I won the National Outdoor Book Award with my last nonfiction book, which kind of gave me the platform to be able to go out there and really attack fiction with some um, promise that I could get published if I if I came up with something that was publishable. And so I really put a lot of thought into the series um, before I went into it. And at the time, I was just finishing up being an at-home dad for about 20 years, doing lots of other things on the side as well. But my wife is an emergency room physician. She was the breadwinner. Um, She worked nights, weekends, holidays, all of that. So I was kind of Mr. Dad hanging out at home. And I had had a wonderful time raising two sons. And I thought, okay, I really don't want to lose that. It, I was kind of missing that aspect of my life. And this, because the kids were old enough, they were still around the house at this time, but they were they were ready to have me not be close by. So yeah. I kind of clung to it by creating this, this fictional family. And then I had fun by creating a couple of daughters because I had raised two sons, had always been terrified of re- what it might be like to raise daughters. And so I thought, <laughs> okay, I'll give it a go. And I did so by throwing basically the proverbial kitchen sink at Chuck Bender, who is my archeologist um, lead protagonist and having him be this new dad at the outset, trying to, after having been a, a confirmed bachelor for a long time, trying to figure out, oh, what is this all about? Family stuff, little girls in the house. Okay. And and so he, it also gave me, a car, uh, of course, plenty of room to, to have him mess up or, you know, if I could mess up, then it was, I could just blame it on Chuck when I was writing. <laughs> so anyway, that was kind of the impetus for the, the family, the stories. Um, I love archaeology. I was familiar with Nevada Bar's wonderful books that were set in the national parks yes. that are tremendous, that featured a ranger. Um, and the park ranger that moved from park to park. So I didn't want to just completely, you know, ride on her coattails. And so rather than a ranger, I had an archaeologist who Chuck moves from park to park doing some sort of an archaeological contract in the park. And then 
the bodies pile up. There's always an archaeological through line to the stories. Um, I, I've actually taken a college level course in archaeology since starting the series so that I could learn more about it and, and really share with readers some of that fascination. And so there's always archaeology involved. Um, there's always a backcountry um, setting to the stories because most folks who go to the national parks don't get the chance to go into the backcountry. And right. so I've really enjoyed with my life and raising my family, uh, spending lots of time in the backcountry of national parks. So there's that aspect as well. So there were all those aspects that were cooked into the series from the start. Um, for those of you listening that are fans of my Patrick Flint series, you now see why I'm a fan of Scott Graham. The family element, the um, amateur sleuth whose um, expertise in a particular area can flow through the books, the backcountry experiences, uh, you know, the, the wild and rugged places. So I really encourage you, if you are a reader of my Patrick Flint, that you are going to love this series. That's a guarantee for me right here. Hold on. I like Stop it. Thank it. you. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Amazon has been linking us for a long time. That's where I first became familiar with you as you kept popping up in the people who read your books also bought Scott Graham. And go. I looked at him and I'm, and I first thought, wait, I thought Nevada bar national parks. I'm like, Oh, archeologist. Ah, amateur sleuth, an unconventional amateur sleuth. And I was really into it from that point forward. Um, now with these, this latest book, death Valley duel, um, are you into the extreme sports as well, like Carmelita is, or is that something that you chose because of our, the race and wanting to combine the uh, plot line with the race? I am absolutely into outdoor sports, but I am not absolutely into ultra trail running. <laughs> However, my wife and I somehow managed to raise a son who is into that sport. Mm. And so he's an ultra trail runner. He has basically gotten us to serve as, you know, talked us into serving as his crew for a couple of these hundred mile type of runs that go right. all through the day, all through the night, thousands and thousands of vertical feet up and down. And it, in fact, was at one of these races, it was like two in the morning and there had been these massive storms. My wife and I were set up, Sue and I were set up at the uh, aid station that they come through. They have the various aid stations. They get checked medically. They have food ready for them. And then um, their crews are there to kind of help them change their shoes and socks if they need to, to kind of rehydrate them, reload their running vests with, with liquids and energy yeah. bars and that sort of thing. So we're there in the middle of the night at this at this uh, aid station. And the people are wandering around it's mile 70 of a hundred mile race. They're basically the wheels are coming off, right? People right. are falling apart. They're wandering around. And, and the whole thing is just kind of this slow motion disaster as people try to finish this race. I mean, they've still got a whole nother marathon plus to go. Yeah. But they've run 70 miles at this point. And, um, and I looked around and I realized like, this is a perfect place to kill people. If you think <laughs> about it, right. Because there's just there's this yeah. kind of cacophony and there's, and it's just this perfect place to set a murder mystery. And so that was where the idea for specifically death Valley was born was, or death Valley duel was born was, was during this race with my, you know, supporting my son. And, and that's why really the, 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 the aspects of the race, um, in the book are drawn right from those experiences. So they're real. And so if, if you're curious about this booming sport of ultra trail running, uh, this is kind of a fun way to learn about that aspect as well. I literally wrote a murder mystery on a half Iron Man that I ran. I, I wrote the story of the half Iron Man and someone said, I would read that as a book. And I thought, well, it'd be better if people died. And so I, you, you know, go. and I, and so I'm, I'm like leaning in here. The other thing I was going to tell you is that, um, we have a wonderful bighorn um, hundred miler uh, up here out of Dayton, Wyoming, and you guys just come up. You're welcome you to stay at our lodge. We have runners every year. Um, we were, our runner was successful this year. We've had a few years where they DNF, um, but uh, I'm I'm very I'm very familiar. And tell your son I've had two foot surgeries because of ultra marathoning, and it doesn't last forever. So live it up. There you go. There you go. Yep. I think he's already learning that lesson. Body gives out. My dad, who's a doctor, you kept telling me, Pamela, you're going to ruin your feet. Pamela, you're going to ruin your feet. I'm like, I'm tougher than that. <laughs> I was yeah. not. Yeah. But we, we do have someone that's talking about wanting to start the book with um, the series with book one soon. And, and I'll tell you guys, these can be read as standalone. But if you're a purist like me, it's so much fun to read from the beginning and watch the character arcs. Um, advance with the main characters. So I'm going to suggest that you do that, even though you could jump right in with Death Valley Duel. Um, so 
segueing a little bit away from the series and the books and more about you as an author, which we've gotten a little bit about here, and you as a writer, we're going to move to what we call the speed round questions, where we talk with authors about similar questions, but get their unique experiences. Us crime and whiners love to Oh, that sounded bad. Winers, crime and wine listeners, um, viewers, there readers. Go. There you go. Love to um, to see how writers are the same and different. So are you ready? I'm ready. All right. So, Scott, when you sit down to write a book, is it sitting down in one place or do you have a nomadic writing style? What's your how do you create your your space for creativity? I write right here in this room I'm in now, and I bounce back and forth between an easy chair and a treadmill desk, and it works really well. Nice. That, that combo works great. Well, you got to get up and move around or your body right. starts to have issues. Um, yeah, and yet I, I use the treadmill desk for hours each day, and it was too much. And so now I kind of sit a while, treadmill desk a while. I actually have a timer set up so that I bounce back and forth every 30 minutes. I love that. I need to get one of those. My daughter has one. I tend to, I, for a while I did a, um, like I set up my bike on a trainer over mm -hmm. a standing desk, under a standing desk, but I found that I just sat there. Right. <laughs> it was just another chair. <laughs> and, and I tried a, a pure standing desk and that didn't work because again, you just stand there and it, just, and it was painful. But that slow walk that a treadmill desk gives you is amazing. That's really cool. The idea of a slow walk so that you yeah. can still, I'm going yeah, to have It's a special treadmill. You can find it online. That's made only for walking for, for office work. It's, it's not a, it's not a jogger. It's not, a, it's a whole yeah. separate deal. Just yeah. No it. side rails, just a pad, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, anyway, I digress here, but see, you already got me on what's interesting. I already got you going. And now do you do is if we had a 360 view of your office, are you maps? And, you know, when you write, do you have all of the things about that park around you books? Are you a big research guy? Yep. Yep. I'm a big research guy. I have lots of books, but I think people know now you, you, there's so much that's on the internet. So yeah. I'm, I'm really kind of dual screen. I'm, I'm, I'm always kind of bouncing back and forth from the internet. I also go to the park before I um, start each mystery, spend, spend several days there right before. And even if I visited it numerous times, just so that I've got it in my head, um, yeah. Google earth can only do so much. I like to being there in the season, you're going to set the book. Does that make sense? Like you go and it's like, okay, that's what's blooming. Right. That's how it actually. Well, that's exactly right. And that's it's, exactly right. It, I, I feel, I feel this process. Plus who doesn't read, need a reason to go back to one of their favorite national parks, right? Exactly. Speaking of which, which one's next? Can we tell? Can we oh tell? yeah, absolutely. Nope. We've, we've, the, the series has been going really well. Um, I'm, I'm proud to say that it's been a real, it's, it's been supportive to Tory House Press and, and the, the efforts that Tory House Press is making uh, on behalf of um, uh, a bunch of young authors to bring up, diverse authors, a, a lot of um, Navajo, Dine authors that they're working with. It's, it's really a wonderful organization. And so, and so, um, no, my books are doing great for them. They, they basically said, as long as you want to keep going, we're going with you. And so, um, the, the book I'm working on now that'll come out is Great Sand Dunes Massacre set down here in Southern Colorado, where I'm from, and playing a little bit on, on uh, looking at Ted Conover's new book out that's called Cheap Land Colorado, about people kind of living sideways out in the West and what that entails. So it's, it's, uh, I think it's been a really fun and interesting kind of sociological aspect to the book that I'll be bringing. Very cool. We had a daughter that went to Adams State and we love those dunes. There you go. My my mother got her master's degree at Adams State as well in Alamosa. So. Alamosa, yeah. There you go. Yeah, I'm just over the hill in Durango, uh, Southwest Colorado. Yeah, beautiful area. Um, our daughter swam there and it's, I think, I believe it's the highest natatorium in the U.S. or or, or in the top two. So they yep. love other teams to come in and swim there and <gasps> <Exactly>. <laughs> not yes. be able to breathe. Oh, well, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So the next one is going to be the Great Sand Dune Massacre. Um, and and let's let's switch from massacring people and instead let's go and talk about what you would do if you weren't killing people in books if you could pick for a day a week a month a, a different career than being an author another dream what would that look like 
You know, I, I love to travel. Um, I think that's inherent in, in the national parks that I, that I write. And I love sharing that aspect in, in uh, that, my love for parks in my books. And honestly, I wouldn't go too far because I would love to be a tour guide. You know, I, I would just love to be out there um, kind of taking people around Europe, taking people around Africa on safari, you know, being, being the, obviously using the locals to give the local flavor, but, but, you know, going with people that are, that, that love to, to explore the world as much as I do and sharing the world with them, I, that, you know, I, I'm a real personable person. I think that'd be really fun. <laughs> you and my husband need to meet. Um, his post retirement gig in his mind anyway, is that he tour guides our lodge guests and just takes them all over this area. He's one eighth Arapaho. So he really loves digging into the local culture, the Native American culture and, and getting out and seeing beyond just, Oh, we went hiking today, you yeah. know, which is obviously wonderful to go hiking, but uh, he, he really has um, a great love for that. So I'm feeling a lot of synergy here. The there you go. That's Great. Yeah, I see where your books are coming from. <laughs> All of this. Um, now, if you were, hypothetically speaking, to win the lottery or an inheritance or somehow come into a lot more money than you ever dreamed, what would be the kinds of things that we would see Scott Graham doing with that money? Um, you know, as, as I said earlier, I'm married to a doctor, so, um, and she loves what she does and they pay her adequately for what she does in the emergency room. And so we, we have a nice life and, and we, we, you know, we're, we're one of those fortunate folks here where we don't lack for anything. And so I would immediately, if I, if I want anything like that, I would turn around and, and um, give it away. And honestly, I'm so proud of what I've been a part of with Tory House Press that a good chunk of my money would go to Tory House Press. They, they are doing amazing things. And what you do when, you know, when you give to organizations that are um, supporting the written word, then you you basically are kind of multiplying that money because um, and this goes for Tori House Press or any other organizations that are that are um, out there you know pushing story and pushing words out into the world you you are kind of multiplying what you give and so I I would see giving to those types of organizations um, ToriHouse.org at the top of the list um, because I know how great they are um, as what I would do if I were to have that happen. I absolutely love that. And and when you think about you guys, when you think about Scott's books and you think about the uh, inherent message behind the books, as he was saying earlier about social justice issues and parks, um, bringing in native cultures, about uh, environmental issues and parks and just conservatorship in general of these natural national treasures and natural resources. You can see just with his series how those investments multiply and then take it um, take it to another level with a publisher that's really looking to seek out and amplify voices that cover these types of issues in a diverse way. And uh, buying his books adds into that too. So there you go. We're not going to tell you not to do that for a second. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So um, I'm trying to decide my last question for you here is, as we wind down, um, were there any that you saw in my, in my, in my panel of questions that you thought, gosh, I wish you'd asked me that because this is your last chance or anything you just want to talk about? Um, no, I, I saw the list of questions and I, and, you know, I really enjoy the questions on, what is it? The Colbert questionnaire where yeah. they hit these people with the same questions. And you noted in your, in your, um, preview to me that these were questions that, that, um, you, you were going to ask in rapid, you know, fashion. And I thought, okay, I'm not going to look at them because it's more fun just to be hit. So I purposely didn't look at them. Um, okay. So then I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with a quick one. Um, is there anything in your office of special whimsy or significance that you'd want to share with us? I see a Kachina behind you, for instance. Sure. And something with feathers coming out the top or what is that? Yeah, that's a, that's a chicken there. But the Kachina, <laughs> yeah, the Kachina is absolutely special because it ties into what we've been talking about. Uh, my wife has been a physician on the Navajo reservation for, for many, many years. And, um, and so that's, that's actually a Hopi, Kachina, if people are familiar with the Hopi Reservation, which is completely surrounded by the Navajo Reservation up on their on their four mesas and um, that and that's a, a, a healer up there. So so bought specifically from um, one of the master Kachina creators on the Hopi Reservation. 
um, when we were, when we, you know, like I said, she's, she works down there. We've got a second home down there. Um, and, um, I say down there South of Durango in, right. uh, on the New Mexico, Arizona border in the midst of the reservation. And a four corners area. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But yes. But, but, you know, that is special to me. And, and because that really speaks to what I'm trying to bring to my series. It's a, it's a real multicultural series. I've got, um, Chuck's wife, I didn't get to mention Janelle is, is Latina and, um, and it's based on years that my wife and I have spent Sue, um, working overseas in places like Guatemala. So I speak Spanish. Um, we did all of her medical training in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, a multicultural melting pot. And so I bring all of that, I think, into the series and it's what makes it fun. Woof, woof, woof. My husband's a lobo. Uh, there you go. Okay. We've got, yeah, there you go. So we've got, we've got all kinds of dual alums. Yeah. My, yeah Sue, Sue graduated from uh, UNM Medical School. So you know it well. Yes, yes. For those of you guys, we're talking about University of New Mexico, and I don't meet a lot of other people married to um, Lobos. So everyone's a Lobo. That's right. That's right. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that I love about um, exploring these great Mountain West areas is that there's so much history that still is uh, really, really ingrained in your modern life because of the reservation setups where you've, you've tried to... Um, preserve culture at the same right. time as our country has tried to eviscerate it, right? For, for a lot of time. In fact, my husband's um, Arapaho native was someone taken off the reservation in the 1870s and adopted out to a white family. So, you know, you look at these, these histories in, in our families, right? In our communities here in Wyoming, we've got a reservation that was um, a, a Sioux reservation and it's Wind River. And the United States government brought the Arapaho in and dropped them right on top of it and made it, oh, hey, I know we um, promised in our treaty with you that this would be your place. But guess what? These people you don't even really like, now you're going to share with them because that's what we think is right. You know, so you have these like the, the um, Hopi being s surrounded, you know, these things that aren't natural to the nomadic existence that they had before and the way in which they flowed in and out of each other's spaces. So I think it makes for um, a wonderful melding of past and present and right. uh, and future, what's going to happen. So yep. I'm sorry, I just went off on a tangent. No, but that's exactly what I've tried to explore in, in, in really in various ways in all of my books. Yosemite yeah. Fall, I think, talks about that issue uh, most directly, um, but also Arch's Enemy set over in Utah, mm -hmm. um, Mesa Verde Victim, which is all about NAGPRA, the, the Native Americans Grave Repatriation Act and all of those things. So people who read my um, books will, will, I hope, learn a lot about what I've sought to learn and share in my books about the, the, you know, the Native experience, both past and present. You'll have to tell your wife that one of the books in my Patrick Flint series is about him going and um, being a medical provider on the reservation. So I must have been channeling Sue. There you go. There you go. All right. Well, thank you so much. This has really been a delight. A delight for me too, Pamela. Thanks so much. You guys go check out Death Valley Duel and the entire National Park Mystery Series, Scott Graham's wonderful books, and hope to catch you on here again sometime, Scott. I'll look forward to it. All right. Bye. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs> So you guys, um, I, I think by now you see there's been a secret behind the scenes connection between Scott's books, my books, Scott, Pamela, that neither of us ever knew until today. And I think you're really, really going to love these books. I am um, super excited this week to be bringing you two shows. So tomorrow I will be back with Doug Pratt and his um Chase Gordon series, a total change of pace. We're going to go into uh, a marine adventure world. Um, and by marine, I mean water. Um, but some of the same things about conservation and about stewardship combined with excitement and murder mystery. So it's going to be a fun week. I'll see you back to tune in for that one. And until then, I'm going to go get something done with this awful hair. And I'm going to do, um, I think I'm going for 30 pages today on the next 
bit Jen Harrington, Wyoming mystery, Walker Prairie. So go out and pre-order that. Um, before I let you go, I do need to remind you that Crime and Wine is copyrighted and solely owned by Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. We're a digital media corporation with over 4 million viewers and listeners in 153 com- countries. And to, to let you know that this has been the year uh, or is continuing to be the year of a bunch of catch up releases from my publisher who made me write three books before they publish any of them. So you can get Her Last Cry, Her Hidden Grave and um, Her Silent Bones the Detective Delaney Pace Wyoming um, mystery series. You can get my latest Patrick Flint, Skin and Bones, which came out this year. And upcoming, we've got Walker Prairie, as I said, and number four in Detective Delaney Pace, Her Forgotten Shadow. All of these you can find um, links to out on my website, where you can also find past shows and watch episodes by writers that I personally read and recommend, um, who I really do believe based upon the fact that you're here and you read my books, you will love as well. So I shall see you then uh, tomorrow, I guess, for the next episode. And I really, really appreciate you guys and appreciate you showing up every single week. You are, quite frankly, the best. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us today on Crime and Wine chats with crime fiction authors and Pamela Fagan Hutchins. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll check back in with us next time for more thrills, suspense, and stories that will mystify, sometimes horrify, and always leave you wanting more.